Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. If I could ask you to kindly take your seats. Thank you. First of all, a very warm welcome on behalf of the Regional Director of WHO, Regional Office for Europe, to this, what is the 98th Global Health History Seminar. My name is Claudia Stein. I'm the Director of the Division for Information, Evidence, Research and Innovation, where this work is placed. The 98th seminar, that is almost the 100th anniversary, and we're getting very, very close. And this is really exciting, because in a minute I'll tell you a bit more about these seminars and the originator of these seminars who has brought this to life. It has been running for over 10 years, since 2004, and it is uh, very generously funded now by the Wellcome Trust, who over the last few years took over the running and the funding for something that I think will really be exciting to you. It started in 2004, as I said, and I was actually there. It started in Geneva, in headquarters, uh, and this was a global health history series that for the first few years was run from our headquarters, but has now branched out into many regional offices, but also country offices. It's become truly a global event. It is organized by the University of York, and there, especially by our WHO Collaborating Center on Global Health Histories, and it is led by Professor Sanjoy Bhattacharya, who is sitting there and who needs no introduction. He's not only a good, close old friend of WHO's, but he has um, spearheaded a lot of interesting work in the area of global health histories. As I said, it was actually first started in Geneva, and now we have had quite a few already here in the Regional Office for Europe, and we have about two or three of these seminars a year. The next one is going to happen in October. So this is something that brings together um, a very, very different set of scientists. It is uh, not a medical seminar, as you know. It brings people from humanities and social science to the world of public health and makes it very clear not only where they intersect, but also how dependent they are on each other. This is really a platform to exchange ideas and perspectives and see um, how helpful the knowledge of social science, anthropology and history is in order to inform public health and to inform policy. It is therefore not just aimed at public health people, it is aimed at the whole community and this is why we're actually live streamed to the public. This is uh, for everyone and it is for the whole of the UN. Um, it is therefore really, really um, practical that we're here in UN City with 11 UN agencies, but it's also very appropriate because obviously public health is something that affects all UN agencies and of course history and social science is something that is very important. Now when we look at the seminars, we see that we have a lot of interaction. We always have presentations, but we also have um, a lot of questions and you will see that uh, a little later you will receive questions also from uh, our web-based Slido. So this is not a talking shop where we just look at people and hear their presentations. You can ask questions and you can actually interact with the presenters. Now this seminar is um, built in connection here at uh, WHO Regional Office with a project that we started a couple of years ago on culture and health. And this is a very important project that really is doing much more than looking to the cultural context of health and public health, but it's really binding social science, anthropology and the medical humanities into health. And to see how can these um, specialties and disciplines inform what we're doing in health policy. It's a project that's led by Niels Fietje, who is sitting here, who's in charge of these seminars also, and who is running a, a big machinery that looks at the cultural context of health at WHO. But what he really is trying to do is to see how humanities and social science can interact and also applied uh, to the work of WHO, and including also the measurement of certain conditions and well-being. The topic for today is very interesting. It is something I think that grabs most of you, and it is really examining the social and cultural context of, of food and eating. And when I heard the title, I was thinking, well, normally I always think in terms of um, you are what you eat rather than you are how you eat. Today we hear a different perspective. Um, we think about food usually as scientists or public health people as the stuff that starts in your mouth and then goes all the way down the alimentary tract. But actually what we hear today is what happens before that 
and why does it happen when it happens, and how does it happen before it even gets into your mouth? Something I have not spent much time thinking about, I have to say. So this is not about physiology and biology, this is about culture and social science. We have a set of very exciting speakers, and I'd like to briefly introduce them, and uh, some of them you may know already, who are really um, internationally renowned names. We have first and foremost Professor Claude Fischler, um, who is sitting at the table. He is uh, Directeur de Recherche, Senior Scientist at the French National Center for Scientific Research and also teaches at the School for Advanced Studies in Social Sciences in Paris. He is an internationally recognized social scientist who specializes in food and nutrition. I've heard the name before. I'm now delighted to actually see you in person. His main interests cover uh, a very interdisciplinary perspective on food and nutrition, uh, with a particular emphasis on meals and the role of social interactions in human eating behavior, close to a heart in the European region. Another expert is, uh, and I hope I get this name right, because I've only been six years in Denmark, Mrs. Mede Strenlö, <laughs> who uh, is also from one of our sister organizations. She's an external relations associate at UNFPA, the United Nations Population Fund, uh, the Nordic office. So she's dealing mostly with the Nordic countries, but she is in the UN and has worked in many countries of the world, including uh, in the Technical Division on Maternal Health Issues in New York, but you've also spent time in Asia, in Sri Lanka, working for UNFPA. Now, of course, this is uh, also uh, a time to introduce a WHO speaker. We always have one of our own scientists, and uh, we have our very own Joao Breda here. Uh, I think almost everybody knows him. If you're from a different UN organization, um, Dr. Breda is in the Division of Non-Communicable Diseases, and he is the Program Manager for Nutrition, Physical Activity, and Obesity. He and his team are responsible for the world's largest and most comprehensive surveillance mechanism for childhood obesity, which is based here at the WHO Regional Office. And before coming to WHO, Dr. Breda, who is from Portugal, was the Portuguese focal point for nutrition and physical activity to WHO and to the European Union, and the coordinator of the Portuguese Platform Against Obesity. So we have a great spread of scientists. Thank you to uh, Professor Sanjay Bhattacharya for making it possible to have these seminars here. These seminars are now officially housed in the WHO Regional Office for Europe, and we're delighted to have a global spread. And I would like to hand over uh, to Dr. Uh, Bhattacharya and please continue with facilitating the day. Thank you very much indeed, and I will give this to you, Sasha. Well, thank you very much, Claudia, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, as ever, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I want to very quickly thank uh, wonderful old friends and colleagues uh, from WHO, Niels and Sine, who have put in a huge amount of work uh, into organizing and advertising this event. I'd also like to thank our three speakers for joining us. So um, without further ado, I want to uh, go into some housekeeping uh, arrangements. Uh, uh, those of you who have mobile phones and want to use it for Slido, may I request you to take your phones out right now while I uh, 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 talk to people who are planning to listen to this online. So if you're online, you should be getting this image on your computer. Um, th th there's a box below the live uh, video feed where you can ask questions, uh, you can enter your question, and then, of course, you have to make sure that you press send. Otherwise, uh, we don't get the message. So please join us and ask a lot of questions. And, uh, uh, and, and now to colleagues who have their mobile phones and want to use uh, Slido, uh, go to www.slido.com on your mobile device, enter the event code hashtag GHH. You can uh, uh, submit your question through Slido, uh, um, and you can also tweet, if you wish, to hashtag GHH histories. Uh, you can ask questions uh, anonymously uh, uh, on Slido, should you wish to do so. So you can ask really controversial questions and not get into trouble with Joao. He won't come looking for you. Uh, uh, so please do. 
use that feature. Uh, and if you like someone else's controversial questions and uh, want to get someone into trouble, just you know, uh, press the uh, thumbs up button and their question will be ranked higher than other questions. So, you know, this is a good time to get even if you want to get someone into trouble. Um, uh, uh, but of course, uh, please tweet as well if you want to. Uh, I have no doubt that with our wonderful speakers, this is going to be a fantastic event. And as Claudia said, I'm absolutely delighted that Global Health Histories is now uh, based in the European Regional Office. Um, and its open-mindedness and its uh, uh, actually global outlook. Uh, but and, and we look forward to working with all WHO regional offices and some very friendly colleagues who are keen to work with us in HQ as well, and some might be online, so hello. So uh, without further ado, Professor Vishler. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I want to thank the organizers, to thank... Uh, Claudia for the uh, introduction she gave, which was music to my ears. I mean that the social sciences should be uh, increasingly accepted and admitted, thanks to the large part to this seminar, uh, in, uh, in the field of public health, nutrition, that's, um, I think it's, a, it's, a great, it's great news. And I also would like to thank the organizers for um, uh, offering this um, novel view, novel, somewhat novel view on food and eating with, the, you know, the what uh, letting some space for the how. And in other words, what happens not just on the plate or in the plate, but around the plate or over the plate. And um, so the title I've uh, devised for this talk is The Social Science of Nutrition. It's not yet a social science, but I think it should be, and it's to a large extent, what I'm uh, about to try and, and, and show you. I forgot to start my uh, <coughs> timer here, but now it's, <coughs> so I gained a, <laughs> a few <laughs> seconds, you know. <laughs> um, all right, let me start with, with uh, a, a philosopher, 16th century Montaigne, who had this, um, uh, quote, which I think illustrates pretty well the seminar today. One must look out not so much at what one eats as with whom one eats. And he also adds somewhere, there is no dish so sweet to me and no sauce so appetizing as the pleasure derived from society. Which, you know, is uh, something that um, I will um, get back to this in the course of the talk. Um, those principles or those ideologies uh, are still present in some cultures and in particularly in, uh, in French culture. So here's what I'm going to discuss. One, I'd like to review some assumptions um, about uh, eating and uh, what it is and what triggers it. And two, I'll try to illustrate the fact that eating is social with two examples. One is commensality, the fact, uh, commensality, eating together around the same table or around the same dish. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, the poss possible effect of eating, the, the effective, uh, real effect of eating patterns over um, what's taken in and how it is taken in. So, if you look at economics standard theory, economics, of course, has something to do with nutrition. But I think the interesting point I'd like to extract from this is that both economics and psychology have some assumptions in common with nutrition. The difference is that economics and psychology have theories and nutrition doesn't. But so they're just pure assumptions, and we need to review them. So if you look at the standard theory in economics, which, with which you're probably uh, more even fam familiar than, than, than I am, first of all, foods are just consumer goods. They're no different. They're substitutable and um, um, fungible is the technical term, I think. Consumers are economic agents, in, that is, individuals, which are supposed to have stable pre preferences, and they make choices, and the postulate is 
that they maximize their utility, which means that they maximize, probabilistically talking, the, the benefit, whether material or immaterial, that they get from their decisions. Okay? So <clears throat> they are rational in the sense that they pick the decision, the choice, that uh, is the, the one that is, probabilistically speaking, the best for them. Okay. Now, if you look at the literature in economics, what is striking is that there are really only two things. There's consumers, individuals, and there's something government. And the whole issue is how much government interferes with individuals. And in between, there's a quasi-stratospheric void, you know, a, a cosmic void. Uh, just individual atoms and, um, and that's it. Now, if you look at psychology, they have lots of theories in psychology, but the ones that are most present in the, in the realm of uh, health issues are this kind of uh, uh, theories. Uh, Fishbein and Eisen, since the 70s, have developed various versions of their theories of uh, <clears throat> um, health behavior, decisions about health. And it's basically uh, the notion that you can predict people's behavior best by knowing their intentions. But I'm afraid it doesn't really work that way, or it works that way for only a small part of people's behavior. Actually, some measurements, uh, you know, uh, statistical uh, analysis have showed that um, the, the maximal variance uh, explained by uh, this kind of uh, uh, models uh, is in the 25, 27 percent. So what, what about the rest? Isn't there a large number of things we do every day without necessarily thinking about it or intending anything? And when we say we make decisions, are we sure decision is the right word? Aren't there things that we do mindlessly that go according to a script and that script is provided by what? It's provided a, in large part by culture. What, you know, let's have lunch, it's 12.30 or it's one o'clock. Why should, have, uh, should I have lunch now? Is it an individual decision or is it just that, you know, is it my uh, uh, hypoglycemia that determines, uh, we might be hypoglycemic, but basically if uh, people in some cultures, not necessarily international organizations, by the way, but uh, if people in certain cultures uh, stop working and rush to the elevator at 12.29, it's just because it's lunchtime. And that's determined, it's a script determined by culture. And we don't necessarily have to think and make decisions about it. Um, nutrition has assumptions, and it has assumptions that, to a certain extent, similar to what uh, I just described. First of all, they are looking at individual organisms. They are looking at individual organisms that absorb calories and nutrients, not foods, not meals, not dishes, not cuisines, not just mostly calories and nutrients that the crux of the matter. And they consider that uh, those subjects make often questionable choices. Don't we all worry about what we eat and what the people we're in charge of are eating? And they consider the need for behavior modification. And so far, this is when they resort to the social sciences. So we social scientists listen patiently to, um, patiently, uh, to, um, you know, we have such and such problem. How can you help us modify people's behavior? And we cannot help asking, are you sure you need to modify this behavior? Are you sure you can modify the behavior? Can you uh, predict what the outcome will be, what the problems will, will be, etc. and so forth. So that's what happens when you have nutrition education, public health campaigns, and what's been happening uh, when it comes to obesity. Most, I think, the history can, can uh, testify about that. Uh, in the US, for at least a century, if you look a little further, if you look down the line, you have 
maybe down to Jacksonian America, there have been attempts to reform people's food habits. And if we look at obesity rates, it's, it's been hardly, hardly a success. And the question is whether this is an unwanted consequence uh, of something that didn't work out exactly well, or maybe, maybe the attempts were part of the problem. We cannot dispel this uh, possibility. Now, why do I have some black here? So, okay, those were the assumptions. Two, I like to illustrate the fact that eating is social. <clears throat> okay, um, first of all, we're a highly social species. And we, if you've noticed, we eat mostly in groups, no matter what the culture is. So this is for obviously practical reasons, division of labor, you know, uh, it's easy for someone living in a society where you can buy uh, uh, chicken legs by the dozen uh, to devise uh, eating as an individual thing that can happen any time without uh, much preparation or uh, with frozen dinners or uh, uh, sous vide, uh, whatever. But if you are in a hunting-gathering society, it's clear that one is not going to cook for every individual uh, at the time that is convenient to him or her. It doesn't make any sense. So we eat in groups, and actually uh, social scientists in various disciplines can testify that in many, many cases, eating alone is highly stigmatized. I have anecdotes, I have no time to tell you now with the time I'm allotted, but um, uh, eating alone is a novelty in our societies and it's to a large extent a problem in a number of societies with a lot of suspicion over people eating alone. Why don't they share? What are they trying to hide? What kind of what witchcraft or anything or poisoning, who knows, have they been performing over the food? Why don't they participate? Participate in Latin, pars capere, part, participate, to take your part, to take part. Why don't they take part? Okay, so the point about, you know, eating gluten-free or being allergic, uh, we published a book, we edited a book last year about this uh, uh, novel trend in Western and in developed societies. So we've been looking at commensality as complex interactions between uh, humans and system interactions actually in which furniture, configuration, ritual, presence of commensals, hierarchy, the food served, syntax of the meal, etc. all are essential in what people finally eventually take in. So let me list rapidly some of the functions that you can identify uh, for commensality. Of course there's the allocation of food, the portion served, uh, there's the fact that the individual taking part is included and uh, if not excluded. So you can exclude people, you can include people, you can share with people you want to uh, have uh, more in common with. Commensality expresses and somehow crystallizes hierarchy in the group. There's a pecking order. Uh, there's a, if you look at the etymology of the word prince, it's from princeps, which is also the Latin uh, origin of basically princeps is the one who is served first in the Roman sacrificial banquet. Um, food and meal structure social time. This morning before lunch and afternoon after lunch. Uh, it concurs to identity formation, it weaves social fabric, that's a quote. It restores life after a funeral, food is served. When people travel, they somehow experience the need to have some food in this uh, uh, a little stressful experience, perhaps. Of course, the commensal ritual, commensalist ritual protects the commensals. It protects them against outside intruders, it protects them against um, inside intra-group competition, it regulates things, and of course, in general, it constrains 
individual behavior, but in doing so, it also supports individuals and, in a way, relieves them of the need to make decisions and choices. And that's something we may have a hard time realizing in our uh, high-choice societies. Now, if you look at this image, don't you think it's a little difficult to think of these people are consumers, as consumers, having preferences and making choices um, on an individual basis? about, in this particular case, meat, red meat, taking into consideration warnings or uh, solicitations of all kinds. Um, that's an important dimension of commensality, that we are programmed according to a script that we apply without even thinking about it. This is a Moroccan situation, so there's a mutual dish, and there are implicit or explicit rules about how to behave in this case. You will not going to be eating across the plate. You're not going to eat faster than the rest of the people. You're not going to, uh, I don't know, pick the best pieces for yourself, the big, best morsels. You're going to make sure the elder will get it or the visitor, the stranger. Same in a Dakar meal, a midday meal, except there's not the spoon, there's the right hand, and it's equally uh, normative in the way people should behave. It's not just that there's no table and there's no fork, doesn't mean that there are no manners. And people are both regulated and um, <clears throat> determined in the way they eat. There's another configuration, a Japanese one, in which you can see that uh, it's um, Kaiseki meal preparing, uh, and it's uh, very formal. And there's a, again another one, a conference at Cornell University, and uh, there's a French breakfast. And in all these situations, it's as if we were confronted to something that comes already installed for us to behave. And our behavior is determined to a large extent by things, people, configurations, implicit beliefs, notions, syntaxes, etc. There's no way these people will think about making decisions of, I don't know, how to make, uh, uh, what, what other things they could have for, for breakfast. Maybe they could think of what they have in a, an international hotel and introduce it into their breakfast, but it's not going to, to go far beyond that. Social psychology has shown us the types of interactions that occur actually over a meal or around the table. First of all, there's what they call social facilitation. People tend to eat more than they are, when they are in group than when they are alone. But the comparison shouldn't ma be made between group versus alone. It should be made between groups because all kinds of different people and situations determine different eating. For instance, we have evidence, we have work showing that a woman eating with a man will eat less. Uh, an obese person eating with lean people will tend to restrict their intake. Uh, there's a mechanism known as modeling, uh, which of course uh, explains the uh, imitation of other people's behavior. There's a mechanism known as impression management. You try to manage the image you provide to other people when you are at the table, and this explains part of the behavior mod modification. Of course, there's the problem of scrounging in uh, school cafeterias, which we've been studying. There is scrounging, there is even theft, and you better watch your plate. And you better sit down with people you're uh, comfortable with and you can trust. And that's what the commensal situation is also about, protecting against scrounging. And in particular, the uh, theft of the most precious item in uh, one of those uh, school lunches we've been studying, dessert. <laughs> Does this have uh, effects on intake? Okay, that's an example. Um, <clears throat> we look at um, uh, school uh, cafeteria lunches in uh, a variety of schools. This is done by Valérie Att in our group. Uh, she uses 360 degree cameras and she puts them in the middle of the table and she has hundreds <coughs> of kids 
in eating, collective eating situations, and she looks at interactions. How does it modify everything? I cannot show any of the videos over the internet, and anyway, it's too noisy and difficult to analyze. But let me show you just this, if I may. Um, on the uh, right the bottom, you see a little girl holding a pretzel. So it's um, <clears throat> um, German National Day in the school in a posh uh, neighborhood in, in Paris, and it's a French-German school, actually. And so they celebrate by offering pretzels. And this little girl states very boldly that she hates pretzels. She would never eat any of this. And a few minutes later, she is actually, as you can see here at the bottom, munching on the pretzel. What happened? Well, what happened is on the tape, and uh, a, a game has developed between the kids using the pretzels as uh, <coughs> accessories. One has been using the pretzel to make horns, another to make a beard, a mustache, some uh, ears, or something like that. So she joined the game, and she found herself sharing the game and sharing the food after that. So this is the kind of basic situation that we observe all the time. I have to <clears throat> wrap up now, I can see. I just wanted to emphasize, emphasize some striking national differences in eating patterns that are based on uh, huge, large numbers, statistics, and show, for instance, um, this is not about patterns. This is extracted from a meta-analysis by Finucane 2011, I think, showing this. The mean BMI increase per decade between 1980 and 2008 has been 1.1 in the US, 1 in the UK, 0.9 in Australia, and 0.4 and 0.3 in Switzerland, Italy, and France. What accounts for this? I mean, how come... We haven't been looking closely into this. We spread the alarm. It's an epidemic. It's global. Yes, it's increasing everywhere. It is, but at very different rates. And it might be extremely informative to understand, to analyze and try to understand why such is the case. Now, let's look at some of the eating patterns thing. I mean, I have no demonstration or proof or anything. This shows from the time use surveys of France and UK on very large numbers of, uh, of people. Uh, you have the times of day on the bottom and the percent of people eating at each time during the day. So the blue line is the French and you can see that at 12.30 every day, 54.1% of the French are eating. Now the similar peak for the Brits for the British in red is 17.6% only, and it's at, thir at 120 or so, a little later. The rest of the time, so there's similar differences in peaks at dinner time. What it basically illustrates is the fact that people eat and have been eating in France at very regular time for a very long time. It's already reported early on in history and um, in the, uh, in the uh, 70s uh, and, and even in the 30s. And um, uh, the American uh, pattern is much more spread out. The, the, I mean, the British pattern is spread out. The reason I'm mentioning the American pattern is that we have similar data for the US, and you see the difference is even more clear. The French don't snack. They eat meals, square meals. And uh, this is very robust data, a pass on this. We have the same data on the three cities of Columbus, Rennes, and Odense. And we have this figure from OECD on time spent eating, which is paradoxical, apparently, that the people spending most time eating on the right are the French, uh, compared to Mexico, Canada, United States, who all have very poor obesity records. Of course, on the right-hand side, there's also New Zealand, who spends a lot of time eating and doesn't have a very good record. But apart from that, France, Japan, and Italy, which I already mentioned, spend a lot of time eating. Apparently, they spend time eating meals, and to a large extent, together. Okay, so <clears throat> I just want to suggest that further research should be applied to these issues. So to wrap up, 
I want to show that the primary, that we all agree, of course, that eating is the primary biological function. You know, any conference on food starts with that. But I want to make very strongly the point that it is also the primary social function, come to think of it. But in a, any human group is basically, particularly in hunter-gatherers, of course, is basically organized around what? Around the hunting and the, and the collecting of food in general. And if you cooperate for hunting or um, um, uh, picking up berries or whatever, you can, of course, eat a little, a few berries. But basically, there's the issue of dispatching all the distributing the food. And human groups are organized around that. Equality, fairness, Society is about, you know, to a large extent, sharing those resources. And we tend to forget that. We have turned this into a free will issue where each and every individual is supposed to be responsible for every molecule they put in the, into their body. But uh, this, is, this is totally irrational when you think of it. So we should be thinking differently about nutrition, and that's the end slide. Food and eating, as I tried to show, are co-determined by culture, and they also co-determine it. Nutrition and public health cannot keep considering eating behavior in terms of individuals making choices of calories and nutrients in the social void. Forget about that, please. And instead, use the social sciences to better understand. Accept the notion that it is often easier to change the world than to change people. You, know? you can... You can nudge them, you can act over the supply, you can think in terms of events happening in a systems um, uh, approach and uh, um, similar perspective. And to complete the uh, picture, I'd like to really over, I could never overemphasize the fact that history is here to understand and avoid repeating some past episodes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I guess it's my turn. So uh, I'm very happy to, um, first of all, to have accepted this kind of invitation by Dr. Claudia Stein and your division, and also to the um, organizers and, and um, really the, all the people involved in, in this process, which is really interesting. And as a WHO staff, and at the same time as a nutritionist, which does not disagree as much as we would expect in the <laughs> beginning with the social scientists, by the way. I think I'm going to say some things which are, of course, maybe challenging, and we would could address it in the discussion. But at the same time, you will see that we are very much on the same page when it comes to many of the things that uh, you've said. Of course, that as a WHO staff might get me into a difficult position, and I'll have to explain. But I was also asked to be, you know, to think outside the box and to discuss some of the issues that are, we think are important. So I'll try to do that during my short presentation. I have to also put my clock with an alarm, otherwise I'm going to, you'll have to stop me. <laughs> and uh, during the, um, short presentation, basically I will try to address the issues related with the facts. So there are some facts that are unquestionable and they are a challenge for us. And I think, uh, of course, we have to find explanations and the best solutions for these problems, but they are problems, they exist and we need to try and address them. Sometimes we may try to be too pragmatic and very pragmatic in terms of public health, but you know, at the same time, it is important. Then I will have another part with reflections on the why and how uh, in terms of food and nutrition. And I will dare to propose some solutions, you know. As we are WHO, people tend to come to us and say, but tell me what to do. And so, I'll, uh, you know, I will dare to be slightly prescriptive and in a way provocative as well. So if I could have my slides, Sasha. Okay, good. So certainly um, today, like never before, diet, and if you 
will also physical activity and inactivity, sedentary behavior are more important when compared, if you like, with other risk factors. This is a slide that most of you have seen. If it would be like 20 years ago, it would be completely different. And the diet-related diet factors would be further down. I mean, it's a global project. These people have been working for WHO in the past. It's a very nice initiative, the Global Burden of Disease. Lots of assumptions, and you can discuss if you agree or not with some of the issues there. But you know, not even including BMI and also other diet and physical activity related risk factors like cholesterol, you certainly uh, are uh, challenged by the fact that the diet related risk factors are obviously the ones that have a uh, bigger impact in global terms. And if you separate the European region from, from the other regions, we even have probably a more challenging situation. And if you go country by country, there's not, the, I think there's only one country, if I remember well, where diet is not number one in the European region when you look at the global burden of disease. Honestly, I don't remember which one it is. But just an example from Austria, I've used this slide a couple of days ago, but I could include Russia, for example, it's even worse. And you know, all the time you get diet, you get high blood pressure, you get IBMI, you get, you know, all these factors that, you know, are related with, you know, food behaviors in a way. And we try to uh, guess where we're heading to. We've developed a study with colleagues in the UK a couple of years ago. We came up with the conclusion that if we don't do anything differently, overweight and particularly obesity, so I'm talking about BMI over 30, is going to increase over the next 10 years. It's not exactly the same way WHO does this, so our colleagues in Geneva and other collaborators have done it and they published one year after our uh, estimates actually were produced, they did more or less the same. Basically, we reached the same conclusion. So obesity is going to increase in all countries by 2025 or 2035, whatever you, whatever you use. So it's really important. More important than just overweight, which is always questionable. A lot of people question, you know, BMI 26, 27, you know, many assumptions there. But if you look at the BMI over 40, it's going to, read, it's going to be around 10% very, very soon. So we're talking about people that need surgery and, you know, really serious obesity-related complications. So this is the situation. In the European region, and it's very interesting that you are talking about all this sort of, you know, clashes and all these tensions between different countries and regions. And, and we really see that in our region. When it comes to adolescent obesity, for example, you see that although the prevalence in the eastern part of, Euro part of Europe is not yet at the same level and as in the western part, but it's increasing much very rapidly. And they're catching up very fast, four times faster in countries like Russia or other countries, if you will. So this is for young people, and it's based on self-reported data. You know we all lie about our height and weight, and girls lie more than boys, and all those dynamics oh, that we are. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you lie on height, it's more effective, actually, when it comes to BMI calculations. So the situation is particularly important. South of Europe, so the, the Mediterranean countries, incredible, isn't it, are the ones with the highest prevalence of overweight and in adolescents and, and children. Uh, we talked about this childhood obesity surveillance system we have in Europe. It's, it's unique, involves at the moment 36 countries, and I would just need you to look at the red you know, line. It's, it's showing that in all countries, more than 20% of kids already have a weight problem. You know, whatever, you can challenge the gross references, the classifications, whatever. So always more than one in 10 kids. Tell me what other health problem affects more than one in 10 kids in all countries of, of probably of the world or in our region. So very serious. It really affects this disproportionately, disproportionately the most vulnerable. So we have an issue of inequalities here. We've, we've shown that. And of course, I mean, things are changing and we're always trying to find answers to these problems. And it's very easy to say, well, it's fat, then 10 years after it's sugar, and we think it's everything. 
If you are a serious nutritionist, you know it's complex and you, you need to look at everything. But you cannot ignore the challenges and you cannot ignore that, that there are elements that probably deserve to be singled out, not as a solution to the problem, but as something that we really need to address. This is just an example of one famous soft drink is not the one you are thinking about, <laughs> but it's actually produced by the same company. It's more orange than black. <laughs> And, and the thing is, the same, very same drink. Look at the amount of sugar in different countries. We were in Turkmenistan recently, 40 grams of sugar, while in the UK is basically half of it. So really, again, fully agree with the, with the statement that you cannot solve this on an individual basis. You really need to use the big guns. You need bigger ammunition to tackle issues like this. And although all stakeholders say, well, we want to be responsible, we want to be part of the solution, then start doing it. One of the things they could do is just level it all by the lowest one. Very simple. No need for sugar tax. Just make it come down. I guess it's not a good idea for many of these. And of course, this relates with the fact that we in WHO, because we are very scientific and we've collected all the evidence and we've shown that there are some, you know, sort of nutrients that are really not nutrients that can have a particular impact and they should be seen as that. Sugar is certainly one of them. I'm not going to go over this slide just to show that you can see on the right hand side, you know, the relative risks when you do all these systematic reviews and you see how much, you know, free sugar, so sugar can have, how much impact it can have in body fatness in, in children as well. So, but again, back to complexity. A lot of people try to explain or try to identify what are the elements of a healthy diet and those that we need to increase and those that we probably would need to decrease. And that bring, comes with a lot of complexity and with very many difficulties. And some of them come with a challenge that this is new science. And people tell us, well, you're nutritionist. You're not reliable because you're changing your mind all the time. You say something today, in five years you say something completely different. I think that's natural in any science, but it comes with additional challenges when we talk about nutrition. And some really turn to WHO and say, tell me what's a healthy diet. I'm afraid we can't say that because <laughs> if we need to have our guidelines and recommendations, they are good based on the best available science. No one can destroy the way WHO does guidelines. We do it very well. They are not perfect, but they are very well done. And we are very strong there. But we have guidelines for what? I mean, sugar, salt, breastfeeding, a little bit more. So our own concept of healthy diet is sort of very patchy and it's not fully comprehensive. So we also need to rely on external sources. So we cannot use the WHO machinery to really uh, um, you know, convey the message of what a healthy diet is. But there are really general message that we can convey and there are things that are common sense that everybody knows. But if you try to implement it in the real world, then it might become very difficult. I mean, you know, having a variety diet, increasing fruit and vegetables, more fish than meat. I mean, these are apparently very easy things, very difficult to implement in real life. Of course, we tend to try to, you know, create norms and guidance for everything. This is why we've developed recommendations on childhood obesity, and it's a very big concern. And the Director General established a commission with very eminent scientists. They have six main recommendations, many of them touching upon the issues of, you know, environment and culture and so on. But those are the most uh, difficult ones to change. I always like to, I like, I don't resist to say that the European region is the one where countries are more concerned and they have probably the strongest sort of mandate and where diet and physical activity are, you know, really, um, they have a strong role in terms of what WHO and the member states do together in Europe. And we have, you know, we have good framework documents that really try to be comprehensive and include these issues of not just how, but also why we have this, um, you know, we eat what we eat every day. So if we don't really try to and think about changing, that's going to be very difficult. 
there are global targets. All countries signed up for them around you know, physical inactivity and diet. These global targets are very challenging. Some are for adults. There's also particularly a global target for nutrition, for obesity in children. And what we did in Europe, we tried to estimate if countries are going to achieve it. Red means no, OK? So for <laughs> most countries in the WHO European region, we are very far from the targets, and we are really not going to achieve it. It's an ad hoc and, and, you know, compilation. And why? This is a mix of policies. So we look at different areas of policy within the different frameworks adopted and uh, approved by member states. And you can see, ag again, red means country countries are not implementing it. Those who seem to be the best ammunition, those who are absolutely fundamental for you to have the best mix of policies, those are really not yet implemented to a large extent. Notably, the issues of you know better labeling, control, and marketing of food to children. You know the big guns. We are not using it because those are really more difficult. Everybody says we teach them and they change. You know, <laughs> it, it's really not the case. So I think we're really on the same page here. We've been in Europe. We're trying in this office. We try to make an effort in terms of supporting member states in working more in the environmental issues and using mainstreaming things that really have shown to be effective, like using, you know, probably you shouldn't exclude using price as something that has a role to play, like all economists would agree with that. You know, some kind of rules and norms around issues like marketing, but also simple things like just getting rid of poison, you know talked about poison. If we have something which is poisonous in food, we need to take it out. That's the case of trans fats. Trans fats kill people. We are running a very simple study in Central Asia at the moment, five or six countries. We're looking at salt and trans fat only. We are astonished. We're sending the samples to a university in the south of Europe. They are very good in doing trans fats analysis. And they had to repeat the analysis because they don't believe in the amount of trans fat. So in Denmark, you have none. In some of these countries, we found 15% of trans fats in some of the foods. So it's really alarming. And when some of the stakeholders say, oh, there is not an issue of trans fats in the food, let's say, food chain in Europe, there is a very big issue here. And that's an area where, you know, you don't feel the lack of trans fats in Denmark, do you? When you go for lunch, there's no trans fats there. So why don't we just? sort of ban it, you know. So uh, we also think that there is really, this is in a way linked with the spiral of consumption. So we are not individuals or citizens, we're more consumers. And that was mentioned before. We're overwhelmed by permanent offer. There's food everywhere, wherever we go, you know. But at the same time, this food is monotonous. It doesn't look because it's very colorful, packaging, all of that makes it very attractive. But you're having the same. Systematically, more food and more fat, more fat and more food, and more sugar, you know? Sugar and fat and fat and sugar. So it's sort of a fake novelty. But you're being conveyed this idea that there's more and more innovation, there's more and more better foods, but they don't exist. So the idea of the meals, I mean, the meal as a meal basically disappears, you know? There's no sharing, less and less conviviality. It's certainly you're suspicious that you're eating alone, but eating alone is probably not the best way to behave, even because you have more food. It's, it's been shown that you have more calories if you're eating alone exactly the same dish, you know? You have more calories. So this issue of, I'm from a country in the south of Europe. I mean, if you would have a, if you're marrying your, dot, your daughter, I mean, you have a celebration with seven dishes. But normally, my grandfather would just have a very, you know, very, very simple meal in normal days. So these differences between your normal day and the day of a celebration, a party, is something that disappears. So we're partying all the time with food. That's really not good. Also, the terminology around food and diet, you know, it's very important, and we're kind of losing it. There was, there was some foods were just for special days. We would always have... Small amounts of meat, why? Because meat was difficult to get, but it was reserved for special days, special time of the year. 
you know, really common foods and foods that are uh, for celebration. And I think that this disappeared. The availability is an issue. So we have more foods everywhere, but you have kiwis from New Zealand, you know, just out there. Maybe not now in summer, but you know, in a couple of months. You know, all this effect of avail availability and seasonality sort of disappeared. We also, I mean, we had difficult times maybe decades ago. There was some sort of not famine in Europe to a large extent in some countries, but scarcity was common. And scarcity was good because it would, in a way, so model your behaviors. So this parsimonious, parsimonious behavior was something that was part of uh, uh, you know, dietary habits, particularly, I would say, in the south of Europe. There's food everywhere, in the streets, in, in your workplace, in your desk, in your pocket, in your fridge, wherever, I mean, every place we have foods. I'm, I don't know if that's bad or, you know, uh, good, but it really has an impact. I really appreciate your slide with the peaks of, of the time. We also looked at that, and they were, I mean, in countries like Canada, US, UK, people don't have organized meals. You have contacts with food. You know, there's really not a meal as such. People don't use tables in some parts of the UK, sorry. I said, why? I mean, you see, it's so very important. The meal is a complex system. So you can't have one industrial pizza that's a meal. No, it's not a meal. A meal is something more. Could start with a soup. It, you know, it has all of this. It's part of a meal. It's not just you have a sandwich and that's it. OK. <laughs> <laughs> so I learned from, it's a quote from one of my, probably my best professor. He used to say, the postmodern consumer Food and meal have lost its traditional symbology. So, and I think we agree. But at the same time, we're always on a diet. You know, we punish ourselves. We have this feeling of guilt, beliefs. You know, body shapes which are far from you know being possible to reach for most of us. That's really an issue. So we think we have a solution, and the solution, as WHO, of course, we have the solution for everything. Go back to your cultural roots, adapting, recreating, reinventing. So I have two examples. One of them, is, which is, of course, the traditional, I mean, the well-known Mediterranean diet. This is a very known study, PREDIMED. 10,000 people followed for, by a long time. Some people criticize it. But you see the difference in terms of those who adopted the Mediterranean-style di diet and those who didn't. It really seems to have a huge impact. More than 40 systematic reviews and meta-analyses looking at the Mediterranean diet, and particularly in connection with NCDs, many of them on CVD and obesity. A lot of positive findings. So certainly the Mediterranean diet could be interesting. It's also very interesting from the cultural and from the historical and from the you know, environmental point of view. And that's good. But it disappeared. If you go to, you know, you look at diet of kids in southern France or Spain or Greece, they don't have their grandparents' diet anymore, and they are less active. I mean, uh, someone working in the mountains in one of the islands in Greece would need 3,500 calories a day, you know? So with the Mediterranean diet from the 60s, you would certainly gain weight. So if you want to use the Mediterranean diet as a model, you need to recreate that diet. You need to adjust for our living of nowadays. So it, it doesn't serve to use, you know, following completely a diet with lots of olive oil, which is healthy, but if it's too much, you're going to gain weight. So you really need to look at that as well. So it's not just a model of diets, it's also a lifestyle, tradition, biodiversity, all of that. So this is, I think, a good opportunity. It's, it has thousands of years, it's been with us forever. I have some questions on the Mediterranean diet. I'll show it on one of my last slides. And I'm coming to the close of the presentation. There's also the new Nordic diet, which is completely different, and uh, because we are in Denmark. And I think we should talk about it. It's, it was kind of created here. And it's sort of a new concept. It's a new concept based on healthy foods. 
that are part that exist in the Nordic countries and in the north of Europe, but it started as a high-end sort of approach to cuisine and you know trying to create better restaurants and to creating a marketing and to promoting the Scandinavian products, and it was very successful. Maybe you're missing the part where it comes, where it's mainstream, where everybody actually adopts it. But it also conveys health benefits. And one of the things that these researchers found is that, well, they try to adopt the to adjust the Mediterranean diet to the Nordic context. It doesn't work. It's really, I mean, it has to be linked to your culture. So you can try to, you know, sell the Mediterranean diet to the north of Europe. We know it's not going to work, most likely. So it's better you, you know, have your feet really, uh, you, you know, use your, your local inspiration. And it's been described. It's always difficult. People say there's many Mediterranean diets, and it's true. I mean, in Turkey, south of Turkey, it's common to have yogurt, but it's not the case in Portugal, for example, which is not Mediterranean, but has the same types of diet in, you know, in, in the south of the country, at least. So really a very interesting approach, which is also starting to be, it doesn't compare with the Mediterranean diet in terms of the evidence, by no means, it's far from that, but it's, it's, you know, it's a recreation of the, the way people look at their diets um, every day. But we have risks, and one of the risks, I think, is that I've seen the Mediterranean diet being, being hijacked by commercial interests, for example. If the Mediterranean diet is local, is sustainable, why, are big, why is big food involved in it? Why are they so interested? Why is it chocolate in Italy interested in the Mediterranean diet? I mean, really? You know, and there's a lot of vested interests here. So we need to protect these traditional diets that are great opportunities from you know, avoiding that they are used for other purposes and that they are really something from the people and for the people. So in conclusion, dietary advice and guidance and guidelines should be sensitive to local food culture and systems. I think that we, ourselves, we have that difficulty in incorporating these in the WHO guidelines. We're looking now at dietary patterns at the global level, and this, the, I think the cultural components are difficulty we have with all these, you know, mechanistic scientists. So it, it really, we discuss it here because I can bring it to these guys in Geneva as well. And I think that it's important to create helpful heating practices adapted to current way of living and easily implemented using the big ammunition, I think. And I would stop here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you to the organizers also for me and uh, for um, inviting uh, sister UN organization to the table and for also allowing maybe a slightly different perspective on what we are discussing today. As uh, evident from this slide, uh, UNFPA is about, this is our mission statement, delivering a world where every pregnancy is wanted, every childbirth is safe, and where every young person's potential is fulfilled. And um, Put slightly differently, in a nutshell, UNFPA works to enable people to have the number of children they would like, to have them when they would like them, and to have them without risking their uh, health or life. And um, we work with the overall umbrella concept that's called sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights. And obviously, in the context of today, reproductive health is where we will find some very strong linkages to... Um, to, to nutrition. Um, I'd like to start out exemplifying this with a quote from uh, the Population Reference Bureau, which have said that adequate nutrition, a fundamental cornerstone of any individual's health, is especially critical for women because inadequate nutrition wreaks havoc not only on women's own health, but also on the health of their children. And this intergenerational aspect of health and nutrition in, in, as related to reproduction is extremely important. And actually, the Population Reference Bureau continues and uh, says that the children of malnourished women are more likely to face cognitive impairment, short stature, lower resistance to infection, and a higher risk of disease and death throughout their lives. I think these quotes sort of... Um, stresses the importance of the linkages between uh, nutrition and, and reproductive health. 
I would like to just um, highlight the photo chosen for this, um, for this slide, which is a service provider. One of the aspects where UNFPA works maybe most directly with, um, with nutrition is in our work to ensure that uh, every childbirth is safe, which means that we try to ensure that women have access to, to skilled uh, professionals um, throughout their pregnancies. And of course, when they meet with health professionals during antenatal care, they'll be advised on nutrition, as they will be in... Uh, in uh, postpartum counseling, where they'll also be advised on, on breastfeeding practices. So, Now, going into a bit more detail on the linkages between reproductive and nutrition, we have, as we've also heard a little bit about today, uh, a growing body of evidence as to the importance of, uh, the, of uh, different nutrients uh, throughout the reproductive cycle. Um, for instance, we know that folic acid and iron can prevent anemia. We know that uh, under-eating as manifested in, uh, in um, what is it called, the uh, anorexia nervosa uh, can stop people from, can stop uh, menstruation and thus conception. And we know that overeating as manifested in, um, in obesity will have impact throughout the reproductive cycle um, impact again on the, on the menstrual cycle, on conception, throughout pregnancy, childbirth, and, and so on and so forth. And we know on the positive side, as also mentioned before, of the great uh, nutritional benefits of, of breastfeeding. But one of our subjects today is on culture and, and uh, recognizing the importance in uh, the import that reproduction is an important life event. Most cultures have... Uh, specific uh, beliefs and traditions uh, around what women should and men should and should not eat when it comes to the reproductive cycle. So I've uh, included a few that I've come across here. 